we have a symbol for recording. Lady Eleonora, the class is yours. Okay, excellent. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Eleonora Ingen with Kelly and I am, um, I'm based in the Barony of the Steps. Um, I have been doing heraldry, well, since middle school, but I've been doing heraldry with the SCA for about three years now. Um, and one of the things that I really enjoy is heraldic art. Um, so we have a couple of things that we're gonna be doing today. Um, you can, I'm specifically gonna be talking about digital heraldic art. Um, so that means you need one of these and the computer. If you have something like this with a pen that lets you actually draw, that makes it a lot easier. Um, but I will go over some techniques to make the mouse more effective. Um, and this is really just going to be a very casual kind of drop in, drop out uh, sort of class. I welcome questions and I'm just going to kind of take you through my art flow, um, see how things go. And we will start. Um, it sounds like we've got, we're, we're going to start with some real basics here. So one thing I wanted to talk about, let's go ahead and get screen share going. All right. Um, so first thing I want to address is the difference between vector and raster images. Vector images, um, the computer is basically taking a graph based on a formula. And so it knows that between these two points, there's a specific formula that describes the arc. And that's how it thinks of the image. So with a vector, the wonderful thing about vector is that you can resize things and you don't get any weird artifacts. The computer can use the, the formulas to fill in the art much smoother. Whereas if we have, here's the same image, this is a raster format. If we take this image and we wanted to change it, squish it, stretch it, make it different, rotate it. When you zoom in, you notice that we start getting these weird little pixelations. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that this is not the ideal way to do this. It's not the most effective way. However, when we are tracing, if we're not going to be resizing it immediately, this isn't such a bad thing. This actually can work in our favor in some ways. So the two programs I've just shown you are both free. This one is Inkscape. Um, so Inkscape is your vector option. There are others out there, of course. And GIMP is a free raster option. I think it can also do vector, but it's Inkscape is a little bit more specialized. The one that we are gonna be looking at today is my preference. Um, it is a paid software. I looked it up earlier today. You have about three months of, of uh, free use if you wanna just give it a try. And then after that, it is $50. The, um, one of the reasons that I like this software is that the pin options are really nice and it also does blending. So I also do um, digital painting, which means that blending on the canvas is really nice. So with that, um, let's get into talking a little bit about lines. I'm using the mouse to start. And what software is this? This is called Clip Studio. Oh, look, give me a sec, I'll post it in the chat if I can get the chat open. Where is chat? Chat, yes, okay, Clip Studio. And I'm gonna obviously show everyone some of that. Okay. So one of the things that you may notice is that over here we've got different pins. Um, I can access different tools on this far side. Um, and each tool has a couple of sub tools that I can switch between. I'm gonna start off with the pin and just pick a nice big chunky one so that I can show you some of the cool things that we're gonna be doing. So with a mouse, I don't get any variation in my line. If I use a pin, 
I can get a lot of variation. If we're using the mouse and we want to have some variation, what we can do is we can come back and use the eraser, which is over here, or I pressed E on the keyboard. And just using the hard eraser, nice big chunky one, we can just come back and go, e now we're gonna erase and smooth that out a little bit. And you can like obviously zoom way in and like carefully remove all of the weird little bumps. But that is one way to get some variation in your line. The other way is to build it up. So we're gonna press P to go back to the pen tool. We're gonna pick a smaller brush, maybe a little bigger than that for demonstration purposes. And there's our regular line, but we want this bit to be thicker. So we're gonna come in and fill that in a little bit more. So there you have some variation with that line. All right, everyone following along, any questions so far? Doing good? All right. So that is the essence of inking. <laughs> Um, the next thing that we're going to do, I'm going to introduce you to layers. So if I press control shift in, that brings up a new layer. Let me pop into annotate here for a second. You can see it right over here. And that new layer now, how do I stop annotating? Am I not? There we go. Now, um, if I do a new squiggle, I can actually move that squiggle independently of everything we just drew. That's doing its own thing on its own layer. And when I get it where I want it, I can hit okay and it stays put. I can come back to what we previously drew and I can move those things. So layers will let you independently move different sections of your drawing which this gets very useful if you're wanting to change the posture of a beast because you can literally use the lasso tool and go, oh, hey, I want this leg right here, whatever that is. And I just want it, I, I really want it, I want it to kind of cock up this way a little bit, be a little wider, maybe like that. And suddenly that section of the line is now doing its own thing. Let me get rid of this annotation thingy. Go away. Excellent. All right. Um, how are we doing? Questions on layers? We're still oh. using GIMP, right? This is in Clip Studio. Clip Studio, okay. Which it, GIMP does something very similar with layers. Um, I just introduced it to you so that you have the free option. Um, you're going to look at some different menus, but the same idea works um, in that we're going to build up our image with layers. Okay. Um, one other thing is that layers, let me put something on here that will make a little bit more sense. So I'm going to come to this layer down here. You'll notice I've selected the original layer and I'm gonna lay a white line in it. The second layer, which is our, the, the one that was just a squiggle, it wasn't affected when I drew underneath it. So the, when I'm drawing underneath it, you can see it's not affected. We can actually invert the order of the layers and that will change which one is seen as on top. So like think of the old transparency films or like an animation cell. You have these clear layers that you're drawing on and then you're going to build them up in whatever fashion you like. How are we doing? Everyone following? Good so far, thank you. Okay, so let's take, we do not need to save that. Let's take an example like this. And this is taken from a 16th century German drawing. Um, I like to just go through and take pictures of all of the, this, is, this little thing down here is the snip tool. It's on every Windows device. 
and you can just literally snip out whatever image you'd like and save it that way. Um, I've already done that. I went through an armorial and picked out a whole bunch of options. Um, and so here we've got a lovely little linden tree. And that is the part that I want to, to take a picture of. You'll notice that up here on my guides, you can see this is only about 300 pixels wide. That's not really big enough for what we want to do. So the first thing I'm going to do is make it way bigger. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to change the image resolution. I want it to be at least 300 pixels per inch DPI. And I'm going to make it 5,000 wide which is kind of stupidly big, but that's okay. We want stupidly big so that we can get lots of detail. All right, the next thing I'm gonna do, I don't need this whole image. I'm not gonna trace the king up here. I just want this little Linden guy. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna find my crop tool, uh, which I think we are going to do by doing a rectangle selection, just delete everything else out. So I go to select, which is M, choose rectangle, draw a box around what I want to keep. And then if I come over here to this one, this is crop. I hit that, it cuts out everything else. So excellent. We have, this is the image we're going to work with. So the next thing I want to do I don't want this to be as dark as it is because it's gonna make it hard to see what I've already traced and what I haven't. There's a button over here for opacity. It's a little slider. I'm gonna lower that down until I can just barely make it out all of the detail that I wanna be able to see. So that's about 50% for this one. And now you see the little checkerboard in the background that showed up? That's telling me that there is a partially opaque or partially transparent image. I don't actually want a partially transparent image, so I am going to make a new layer and I'm going to fill it with white. I'm going to temporarily turn this one off and we're just going to fill. Okay, so now it's no longer transparent. I can see it better. It doesn't have a weird checkerboard. I'm going to make a new layer and we're going to start with the pen tool. I'm going to pick one that's about the same width as most of the lines that I see up on here. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit. All right, so I'm still working with the mouse here. Uh, I'm going to do the first one with the mouse and then after that I'll switch over to tablet. The outline that I want to see it helps if we pick black. So I came down here to my color picker. We're going to black is like this. Now, one thing is, if you notice these lines are pretty straight, if you click in one spot and then you hold shift and click again, it will make the lines between them perfectly straight. So that can actually save you some effort. I'm not really happy with this so far, so I'm going to go down to a slightly smaller brush and try again. Let's actually do all of the straight lines first. So to here and back up to here, here, down and back up. Got a straight line here. One of the lovely things about doing heraldic art is that it does not have to be perfect. It definitely does not have to be perfect. We're just going to make it look good enough because good enough was good enough for the Middle Ages. So we're going to trace each of these little lobes. Okay, I got something I don't really like over here, so I'm just going to redo that one. I hit Control-Z undo for undo. And we're going to come out here and try that again. There we go. Okay. 
Okay, we have a curve here. And if you can break things down into their component lines, you're going to have a little bit of an easier time. Like stop so that you notice I went straight into this other line. Well, now if I don't like it, I have to do this line again that I did like. So stop often and make sure that you're happy with what you're doing in stages. Um, to get around, uh, if you press and hold the spacebar, it will let you grab the canvas and move it. So that's how I'm, I'm moving around. You can also, up here in the upper corner, there's a little thumbnail. You can move around that way. Um, there's also a way to, I think it's, yes. If you hold shift, you can actually rotate your canvas, which can be really useful when you're using a pen and you're trying to like rotate your arm around a funny direction. It, sometimes it's easier just to rotate the canvas to get the line you wanted. So then we're going to do this little squiggly root. Not want to pick that color up. There we go. Okay, so we've kind of got a rough outline of the thing that we want, but it's pretty boring. It doesn't have a whole lot of nice look to it. So one thing you may notice on the original is that some of these lines are a little bit thicker and some of them are a little bit thinner. So we kind of want to emulate that a little bit. We can come back in here and thicken this line up. We can get a much smaller brush than that and make these kind of come out to little points so that they look more like leaves instead of big floppy things. And right here where it meets the, the trunk of the tree, there's a big old blunt point and that doesn't look so great. So I'm gonna smooth that out a little bit. Okay, and the other thing that we could do is we could go in and make the leaf tips a little bit more pointy so that they're not quite so blunt. And let me just say, do not expect to be this fast. I've been digitally painting for a very long time and I started on a mouse. Um, it, there is a level of practice that is required for working with the mouse. So may take a little getting used to and my hand still occasionally wobbles in ways I didn't want it to. All right, so that looks a little bit better. That looks a little bit more acceptable as far as like, yeah, I could see that being on a, somebody's shield. So any questions about this one, using a mouse, anything like that, I'm just gonna go in and kind of clean up a little bit. And I presume you can do the same thing on internal detailing, like the manes of lions. Oh yeah. Or the claws or things like that. Yeah. Um, sometimes I actually find it easier occasionally to paint something in black. Like if I'm trying to do a really tiny little lion claw, sometimes it's easier to do this and then erase into the shape and then come in with a white pen or or you can also just erase it out but and erase out the center and then there's your little lion claw and you don't have to try and oops, you don't have to try and like individually trace it out the the edge of it um but for this one we're not doing that so that will give you a really basic outline i picked a, a pretty simple one to start 
Now I'm going to, or, sorry, were there any other questions before we move on? What would be the process for taking that and turning it into a new vector? Okay. In your presentation. You're right. I, I did not, I didn't save it yet. Um, so if we're going to save this one, one of the options that we have is export as a single layer. Um, if you turn this off, I'm going to turn off the visibility for the other layers. I'm going to grab my fill bucket and fill the part that I want to keep with white. Um, so this actually gives me a clear background with a white element. I'm going to export it as a PNG. PNG means that it's going to retain transparency. So it's not going to refill this background in white. And then I'm going to save it to wherever I'm going to save it. So this will be, let's uh, put this under points. It's going to give me some options. Um, generally, you don't have to change anything. You don't really need text. And then I'll hit OK. It'll show me a preview. I'll hit OK again. So let me jump over there and I'll show you what this puts out. Uh, oops, that's in traceable art. I just want my plants. OK, there's my little linden that I made. So now there is your transparent item ready to go. Um, I can now drop it into Inkscape if I wanted and transform it into a SVG, which this is the, this is probably getting a little beyond the scope of our class, but um, I'm going to go ahead and pull it in anyway. So I'll just drop this into Inkscape. All right, so you can see that it's still clear back there. If I tell this to, uh, let's see, we want trace bitmap. Mm -hmm. Let me make sure we're doing, yep. All right, this has now given me, we're looking at what the computer sees now. All of these little lines are editable, but the computer has more or less decided what this looks like. So I can actually, no, stop that, go away. I can actually now take this and I can resize it just like I could any other, any other vector drawing without getting the, that's the bitmap. Not that one, this one. This one is the vector. So this one I can resize and I don't get the weird lines. So they, the two halves kind of work together. Um, I find it easier to trace a raster and then import it into a vector. How are we doing? Did I just fly over everyone's head or are we good, doing all right? No, I'm good. Okay. And My plan is being recorded. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, like I said, this is getting a little beyond the scope of where I was hoping to take the class. So we're going to not worry about that part. This is the part that, that I was hoping to show. Um, the other thing is, if you did not follow how to do that whole vector thing, if you will submit your art to the Traceable Art Project, uh, there's a very, very kind gentle who does all of that special transposing and stuff. And it goes back up on the website and then you can pull it down in a variety of styles. So you can get, you know, the, the transparent PNG, you can get it as a JPEG, you can get it as the SVG. All of those things will let you um, manipulate the image in different ways. Yes, Mathquin is happy to be used in trade for getting your art. 
and it's it's good to have art for everybody like that if you're willing to release your art out into the wild please please do in fact all of the ones that we're we're working on today i'm probably going to submit so all right we're going to heraldry references these are things i want to trace give me just a moment uh, Okay, and all right, so you've seen kind of the basics of how it works. Um, does, do any of these images draw people's attention? Because if not, I'll pick, but feel free to let me know if you see one that's really cool. First one to speak up picks the next one. Oh, uh, the crescent, the crescent. This one. All right. So what we're going to do, we're just going to grab that one. We're going to drop it in here. And there we go. We're back at the start. I will go ahead and close this one out. I do. Don't save that. Hang on. Let me save it as something else. No, it's not a PNG. What are you doing? I said in Clip Studio. Okay, for some reason it tried to get the wrong file ending. All right, so we've got an increscent decrescent here. And we're going to do the same thing. You'll notice it's pretty small. We're going to make it bigger. So bump it up to at least 300. Nice and big. That way we get lots of detail. And this time around, I'm going to be using the pen tool with my tablet because it is a lot faster and easier. So it does take a little bit of getting used to in terms of getting getting the <laughs> um, getting the hand eye coordination changed up a little bit. We're going to add a new layer. Fill it with whatever color. Drag it down below. And we just want this section. All right, so one thing I'm going to do here real quick before we kind of continue on, this is a little bit off kilter. I'm going to make a couple of changes to it just to help straighten it up. So we're going to kind of futz with it a bit. And in fact, I'm going to only change part of this guy. Oh, really? Does not like that. Okay. This is the guy that I really want to rotate a bit. So let's go ahead and get him straightened up here. Don't medieval scribes wish they could do that? All right. So we've gotten them neatened up a little bit. I've gotten them turned down on opacity so that I'm not, so that I'm able to see where I'm actually working. And we're gonna go through the same process, except a little faster this time because I don't have to worry about some of the um, finicky bits of the, let's do this, this will be good. Uh, finicky bits of the mouse. I've switched over to the mapping pin 
the mapping pen, it lets me do really, really thin lines and then really thick lines. And I am clearly on the wrong layer. So new layer. All right. So we're going to go in here. Oops, that's not great. Let's zoom in a bit. We'll start here. And just talk to myself the whole time. Oops. My hand suddenly slips. So with the tablet, I can feel a little bit more confident in doing longer lines because I get the line variation from the pressure on the tablet. And I also have a little bit better control over where exactly the eraser goes. So that way I don't have to worry so much about exactness because I can make two strokes or I can come in here and really precisely control where the eraser is going. These guys are big enough that I'm probably going to have some trouble doing it at that small. So sometimes if you zoom out, you'll be able to get a little bit uh, better line. I'm actually going to come over here and turn up my stabilization uh, because that is a cool feature that lets me, oops, see it didn't want to turn far enough. We're going to turn that back down just a bit. Um, it makes it less wobbly. So if I am going slowly, it actually will kind of help me out. And oh, I had a wobble there, but not too bad. All right. So this line I'm not terribly happy with. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new layer. And I'm going to draw the line I am happy with. And then I'm going to come back down to this previous layer and erase out from under it. so that it looks nice and smooth. And I don't have to worry about accidentally erasing things I wanted to keep. All right, and then what I can do is I can merge this layer down. Control E will drop it down onto the, the layer I'm working on. And we can continue going. So this eye, it looks like it kind of does this. And we'll go with that. Let's zoom way out and get this all in one shot. Um, one thing that can help with the longer lines is if you're able to draw more from the elbow than the wrist or more from the shoulder, that will give you a little bit of a smoother line, like that's using my wrist. If I loosen up and use my elbow, no, not today. Works better on straight lines. If I'm trying to use my wrist, I kind of only have this much. If I'm using my whole body, I can keep a lot straight, strong, blah, 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 straighter lines. So one thing some people will do is they'll kind of have like sketchy lines, which that works great if you wanted to add some texture for fur. Um, it's not always the look you're going for. On these, they're, uh, they're moons. I don't think that they're going to have fur. I just wanted to confirm the the thickness of the line is being controlled by the pressure of your stylus? That is correct. You can you can change it to be other things. Um, in this instance, I actually, uh, let's see if it has it handy here. Oh, no, not. So there's actually a whole bunch of things that we can control. Um, the stylus is being controlled by the, the 
the size is being controlled by the stylus. Um, you can do things like tell it it has to be at least one pixel. It can't be zero pixels. Um, you can tell it you know, all sorts of things. You can change the opacity um, and set the opacity to be controlled by the stylus. That means that's going to act more like a brush. Uh, let me grab one that, that does that. So in that case, it would do more like this. And you can go from thick to thin. Cool. OK. Because for a mouse, you wouldn't necessarily have pressure control. Right. So you'd have um, some other method. Right. Uh, tablets are, honestly, if you think you're going to be doing a lot of this, get a tablet. It's, it's worth it. Um, if you have an Apple product, um, I know the Apple Pencil, um, it, it can do a lot of these same things. So you just have to get a, a compatible tablet or whatever else. Um, the Does one that I'm... Work? I was just curious, does it have to be a modern tablet or is this the kind of thing you could buy a used one or an older oh, one? Oh yeah, no, mine mine is a bamboo. It's probably from 2000. Okay. Um, so as long as it's still working, um, mm -hmm. Wacom is the company that makes the one I'm using. Um, I'm using a Wacom bamboo. Uh, and the cool thing about the bamboo is that it has a texture on it that actually feels like paper. So it's a little bit less slick. Um, that's a that's a common thing for people to dislike about some of the the older tablets. Um, so this section here is textured a little bit. So when I'm drawing on it, it doesn't feel slick. It feels like paper. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. He's gonna get a little frown. That's fun. All right. So really, this is just going to be the rest of the class. Um, if you have specific questions, let me know. And I'm just going to go through and draw a bunch of stuff. There we go. We've got an increscent decrescent here. And let's see what they look like without. This guy's kind of got a weak chin. Let's fix that. All right, um, so with more complex shapes, rather than trying to use the fill button, one thing I like to do is I'll come over here and I'll get the, the little magic wand and select outside. And then I will expand or feather the selected area in just a little bit and invert it. So what this has done is, is selected just the stuff that is actually stuff and not the background. Everyone follow kind of how that worked? Let me demonstrate. If I wanted these to be, let's pick a nice yellow. Nope. We're gonna add a new layer that's gonna be just for colors. This is the area that I have selected. Do you see the little dotted lines? They're following the outside edge, but just inside of the black area. So that's gonna keep any of our paint from leaking out, but make sure that we fill everything in. If I fill those areas and then turn our outline back on and drag it up above the colors, now suddenly we have colorful images. And we don't have to worry about going in and filling in any of these weird little lines. Welcome to the joys of transparency. And what tool did you use to make that happen? So what I did is I made a new layer that was going to be for the colors. Right. I meant the outline. How, how did you get the outline? Okay. The dot I got, let me, because that was again. really cool. <laughs> we'll do it again. Okay, come over here. I find the magic wand button. Uh -huh. um, what this is going to do is it's going to select everything that is contiguous. 
and there's various settings about how much gap it's going to consider contiguous. You may have to do like some special double selections or like do include this, don't include that. Um, but effectively, you want to just select the background. And then in some, in some order, you can either invert the selected area and shrink it, or you can grow the selected area and uh, invert it. So in this case, we're going to grow the selected area by one pixel. So it's going to go one pixel into the black, just to make sure that we're not having yellow leak out on the edges. And we're going to invert it. So this area now looks like this. I make a new layer. This is going to be for my colors. And I grab the fill bucket. And I'm going to fill in the areas that we wanted to do. Now you can see, because I made the new layer on top of the background, that's not going to quite show our outlines and our internal detailing. So we're going to drag that layer down under the outlining. And now we have magically no weird white pixels. That's amazing. I can't tell you how much time that would save. <laughs> Hours of filling in those little litty bitty pixels. Yep. OK, I am. since we're also doing this, let's say that you had these but they're going to be filled with white because we're working with something that a client gave us that is, you know, ancient and terribly old and difficult to work with. So we're, I'm just going to fill these guys in with white real quick. All right. So now you can see that yellow layer, it's not showing up at all because it's all underneath this white layer. There, let's put the background back on, then you can see. So unfortunately, our yellow is not showing up. What we can do is we can take this layer, and we're going to set it to, let me find it. Uh, I don't do this way often, so one second. Where are you? Ah, there you are. OK, blending mode. This is going to blow your minds to watch. Multiply. Multiply, if you have a black and white image, it pretends all of the white is clear and all of the black is black. Did you follow? I'm, I'm trying to. My boys are very noisy in the background. I'm sorry. OK, no, that's fine. So the normal layer, this is a black and white layer. The white is going to be treated as if it's clear, and the black is going to be treated as if it's black. So when we go to multiply, now we can see that color layer underneath. Oh. And we still don't get the weird artifacts. Normally, if you were to just let me set this back to normal. If we were to try and let's let's do this the hard way. If we were to try to like select this and delete it out. Okay. Yeah, but see how we still have some of these weird whiter sections. It's not so bad on this one because it it's not been like resized 16 um, billion times. Um but occasionally you'll end up with weird little artifacts on the edges of everything. Instead of doing that, what we're doing is we're just taking our line art layer and we're setting it to multiply and that's going to let it have the color show through underneath. Hmm. So if we wanted to come in here and add like some cool internal detailing to these moons, we can do that. Oh, that's cool. So here I'm just drawing different colors on the color layer. Give him a little bit of depth to his nose. All right. Any other questions on this? Oh, sorry. This is 
Um, since this one's set to multiply, we do want to make sure we set it back to normal before we try and export it to anything. Let me open up something I have previously worked on. Yeah, what have we got? Okay, I'm gonna pull open the infill because this is a fun little trick. All right, this is my infield that I have submitted recently. Um, and one of the things I did was I have it in grayscale here, but if I wanted to turn it blue and add some internal detailing, that is an option. Um, what I did here is I took the line art layer and I duplicated it. That's why it says layer four copy. You can also rename these if you if you want them. And then I set this little thing right here. It says lock transparent pixels. That will keep it, anything that is transparent will stay transparent. So I'm going to turn this off for a second. We're going to I'm going to show you the trick again, or I'm going to walk back through how I did this. So I'm going to duplicate this layer. So now I have copy two of the line art, the black line art. I am going to lock alpha, which means any of the transparent pixels are going to stay transparent. Any that are not are going to not be transparent. This only works if you have your line art and your color on separate layers. Okay, I'm going to grab a white pen and I'm just going to do this. Look at that, I can change the color wherever I want. That is a nifty trick. So this is great for internal detailing. Like if you needed this to be a, let's, let me duplicate this guy right here. Let me just actually fill this real quick. No, that one. And we're gonna turn that off. Oh look, there's, there's my dude. But I want him to be Sable. Ah, uh, the bane of heraldic artists everywhere. All right, I now have a sable infield with unfortunately sable outlines. We go to our pen, we use our coloring. We're gonna turn all those little details much easier to see. And honestly, I would be doing this without the, sometimes it's easier to put a color behind it so that I could actually see what I'm doing. I just come in and get all of the internal detailing, turn it, turn it white. I'm gonna be real messy and real quick about this because I'm not going to do anything with it. Add some detailing there and there. Cool. Good enough. Nose. Tongue. All right. So now when we turn the black back on, now it's got some internal detailing. And obviously we're going to need to do some cleanup here, but that is a neat trick you can do with line art to make it easier to see on Sable. We are not going to save any of those changes. All right. So anyone else have, do you have anything in particular you want me to draw or any particular problems you've run into that you wonder if there's just a real quick, easy solution?
the comments are all just going cool, cool, cool. <laughs> okay. I, I haven't looked at them yet, so. So with the crescent decrescent, um, mm -hmm. any particular reason why uh, you wouldn't have just chosen to duplicate and invert? Well, the, uh, for this one, yes, you can absolutely do that. Um, but I noticed that they have slightly different expressions. Okay. If you wanted to duplicate and invert, you can literally grab this guy, copy, paste, control T will switch it to transformation mode, flip him horizontally and drag him over here. Okay. Wow, I'm just in awe. Here, like, here let me just log in over here, so. <laughs> Uh, okay, so do we want to try a little bit more complex one, or we've got like there's a sea unicorn here, there's Griffin, got a monk with a book over here. What about the axe in the uh, piece of wood? This one. Awesome. Let's do this. Uh, oops, that's canvas size. Do we want image resolution? In beginning, much bigger. Then we're going to grab this. We really just want this section. Crap. All right, now we're going to go need that selection anymore. We will add a new layer and fill it with white. I need to turn this off because otherwise it'll try and fill in parts of the image, which that's not much help. All right, and then we're going to go new layer and set this opacity down to about 50. Grab a black pen. and get to work. So even with the tablet, we can still use the um, the straight lines. It just it does them at maximum size. So generally, if I'm doing a tablet, I'll stick to just the tablet, not using the uh, um, the straight lines option. And one thing that I do like about it is that it lets me have a little bit more life to the lines. Like they, yeah, they're not perfect. They don't have to be. Medieval scribes were not perfect. And you know what? I like a little bit of life in them so that they don't look so sterile. All um, right. One thing I hadn't really talked about is giving different weights to your lines can actually change people's per perception of how those lines are interpreted. Um, so for example, by thickening that line that I just worked on, it makes the ax look a little bit heavier in that direction. If I were to only thicken this little curve of it, it now looks a lot sharper than it did. Um, so that's the sort of thing that you're just going to have to kind of play with a little bit and get it to where you like it. Um, generally speaking, things that are in the foreground are going to be thicker outlines. Things that are in the background are going to be less thick outlines. And things that are on top get a thicker line than the things that are in the back. So for this one, I have the axe have a thicker line than the log behind it because your brain is going to interpret that a little bit more like the axe is on top. I mean, think about anything that you see. The front line of this is going to be thicker. The back line is going to be thinner. But outline lines, eh, they can be a little bit thicker regardless. Your brain just says things that are bigger are closer. And you don't have to 
finish every line. Like some of these we can just leave as cool little Yeah, let's get a little bit of make it look more wood like. All right, easy peasy. In in the period examples that you're tracing, do you often see them play with line weights or shading? Or from so, from what I've seen, most of the time that the images tend to be kind of a basic, either straight on or. Depends on when you're talking. Um, so let me grab a different example. Here you can see the spot where the fire is meeting the the firebrand, the the stick. You can see mm -hmm. that there's places where it's a much thinner line, and then the outline is going to be a thicker line. So okay. that implies that the two things are closer and touching. Okay. Um, let me see if there's another kind of good example of this. Uh, we also see it. This is really more you see it late period than early period. Um, Let's, Plus, let's, they're adding internal texture details. Yes, yes, they're also adding internal texture. Three dimension. Um, so let me grab a pen real quick. And I'm going to do this in a different color just so we can see it without having to jump through all the hoops. All right. This line is fairly thick. I'm not going to do it in a different color. There we go. This line is fairly thick here. And it stays fairly thick and then it gets really thin right there. And then it gets thin, it comes down thin, and it gets thick here. So what this is telling me subconsciously is that this spot, it, this spot right here is connected. Oh, okay. And if we take this line up here and this line right here they're about the same weight but then if we look down here you can see here's one line and here's another line and they make kind of a a connection so this spot right here is really thick because that's where we have two different here's one branch and then here is a second branch that are making up that line. Gotcha. That's kind of cool to know because my my impression of heraldry just from some of the folks I've talked to is that it it was always meant to be more representative of a thing that they didn't incorporate texturing or you know perspective all that much. It was just kind of supposed to invoke a certain image. It wasn't supposed to be you know anything close to a photo realism or anything. Like right. That. The the later you go, the more you see that sort of um, variation in depth. Um, here we can see it, for example, right here. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And this line is thicker because it's on the bottom than this line up here. Gotcha. Is that some sort of a scroll, I would assume? Yes. Yeah, I think it's meant to be a scroll. Gotcha. All right. Let's see. Do we have other? I don't really have many earlier ones. Um, but this would be a good example of one that would lend itself well to just one width all the way around. You can see that, that all of the lines are about, let's see, like that thickness. So, it, it. we could almost just draw this strictly with the, the line tool if it weren't for some of the curves. All right, did anyone have one that they wanted me to do next? I'm gonna close a couple of these.
I have a question. Um, sure. You showed us how you did the straight lines, a point to point with the straight line using the mouse. Mm -hmm. Does it do the curve like you do the straight line to straight line, but then you can pull the curve outwards? Are you able to do that with this program? I know Inkscape can do that pretty easily. Um, I think you can do it. I haven't really played with it much because I don't need to. I think you can do it with their line tool. Um, if you do something like this. Let's see. Yeah, okay. So what you can do, there is a line tool in here uh, that will let you make continuous curves um, or bezier curves. That was the word, the bezier curve. I could not get the word for the bezier curve, but yeah. that's exactly what I was thinking of. Um, when you're not tracing something or you're wanting to change it a bit and you end up going a little more freehand, that gives you some beautiful curves. Thank you. Right. Um, so yes, and if you're, you just want a bunch of delfs, yeah, we can do delfs. There's, change the roundness of the corner. And, let's see, what do we got? There's, there's a nice square thing and you can actually just choose Um, so rectangles, circles, polygons, things like that, that are, those are relatively easy in here too. Um, I prefer to do those in Inkscape just because I have a lot more control over it. Um, but they can be done. And sometimes you can break things down into, oh, well, it has a bunch of polka dots that I don't want to hand draw. So I'm just going to use the ellipse tool and then, you know, copy and paste that single polka dot over and over. if you're doing a heraldic panther or something. All right. So do we end up with any requests from... I have a couple things in chat, looks like. Let me pop this open real quick. Yep. Hey. All right, if y'all don't pick, I'm picking. Is there any tool uh, that would do um, auto tracing from these uh, scanned images? Not that I'm aware of, I can. So the magic wand wouldn't necessarily pick up the, uh, the borders? Well. Part of the trick is that you have to get it, there's a certain level of sensitivity. If you have something like this, where it can be a very black and white image, mm -hmm. you have a much better chance of making it work. Um, give me a sec, let me try something. And you're gonna come on a magical adventure with me. All right. Um, oh I'm boy, gonna, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I know. What I'm trying to do is I'm going to try and turn this thing black and white so that I can just get the line art on its own thing. You'll, I picked this one because it has kind of some gray in it. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in here, add a correction layer, go to brightness and contrast, crank up the brightness, crank up, well, not quite that high. Yeah, no, oh, that's too low. Okay, we're going to go about there. All right, so what I've done is I have way overexposed this in an attempt to get all of the colors to just chill out. And we're going to merge that down for a moment. Um, then the next thing that I'm going to do is I am going to tell it to auto select all of this blue. Yeah, actually, that's not too bad. A few little bits and bobs here. Let me try something else real quick. Come here, yeah. Uh, 
and then multiply is not going to work on that. I've gotten it too light. Well, let's just start deleting out sections and see what we get. Yeah. Okay, I think this is about as close as you're going to get to a quick version. And depending on how much you overexpose it versus not, that may be kind of as good as it gets. From there, what I would do is lock the transparent pixels and just kind of go over it in black and hope that that gave me a little bit more color or a little bit more connectivity between some of the sections. So you might still have a little bit of doodling to do just to kind of fill in like here where the arms got overexposed, um, but I think that's going to be the closest you're going to get to automation. So not quite what I would consider ideal, but let me just finish this guy out real quick. Maybe that's a pencil I want to pin. Yeah. Oh, that's because I have the transparent pixels locked. Funny that. All right. So one thing is this doing this actually does help a little bit because it means I don't have to be quite as precise because most of it's already drawn in. I'm just kind of going over and helping it out a little bit in places. And I did not embiggen this one, so that's why it's very, very pixely. Um, one thing I do try to do uh, is I try to minimize these little itty bitty sections. Let me grab a pen so you can see. These sections right here that are like one pixel wide where it's barely touching. Um, I try to minimize those because those will be very hard for somebody who has not taken this class to know how to go in and, and color without having a bunch of artifacts. So especially if I'm gonna be turning this in for um, traceable art project, I try to make sure I don't have those, which means I try and keep everything very open so that even if it's small, it's not actually touching anywhere. Okay, so in retrospect, I think if I was going to do this again, I would duplicate the layer first so that I could draw from the original. But that did kind of give me a little bit of a head start. And then we can just erase out all the stuff in the background that we're not going to use. So, yeah, gone, 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 gone.
There we go. Like I see a unicorn. All right, Dan, anyone have other questions or other challenges for me? So I apologize if you mentioned this earlier, but I checked in a few minutes late. The, the goal of everything that you're doing here, is this for folks who find period examples of things they would like in their heraldic device and they just need a, a digital version of it to use? Is that generally how this is working? What I am usually doing is I will go through an armorial and find examples of cool, interesting things um, and then I stick them all in a folder and eventually get to them. And so then what I will do is um, trace them out. And I like to send them into the uh, Traceable Art Project, which let me. You go to heraldicart.org. This is the book of Traceable Heraldic Art. If you are not familiar with this, it has a ton of resources. Um, and you can actually go and if you go to, I think it's under about, and then there it is, contributing art right here. Mm -hmm. You can fill this out right here. You just put, you know, your, your name, um, you upload the file, you give it a quick description, add any other comments. Um, this will automatically license it under Creative Commons so that other people can use it. Oh. Um, there's some other options and you can hit details. But then what happens is the person who runs this, um, which I would slaughter his name if I tried it, <laughs> um, will then take your, your drawings that you've done, um, like I've done an infield. There's my infield. It's right here. Gotcha. Looks familiar. Yeah. And it shows up with your with your name on it. Um, and it he transforms it into all of these options. Um, so now if I wanted to take my infield and grab it as a black and white vector, there it is. Um, so I can come in here and I can just go save link as. I can save it wherever. Okay. And then I can open it up in Inkscape or I can open it up in whatever else I'm going to work with. Okay. So it's not, I guess you can do this specifically for people who have a need for their device, but in general, mm -hmm. it's creating a database of digitized common symbols that people can use. Yes. Um, okay, cool. If, and, and sometimes there's a need for like the ability to create one on the fly that maybe I don't have a specific example for. Um, like, let's say, I have no examples of a periton in my um, in my little library that I'm wanting to draw, and somebody really, really wants one that's lodged. Yes, Justin, when I'm doing this just for you. Um, so what I might want to do is I'm gonna, you know, sketch out. Okay, here's here's my deer. Here's his chest. He's got back legs. Doing this thing. It's got a head. And it's got some wings. Okay, so now we can take our sketch and literally just do the same thing that we were doing. Normally I would do a much more extensive sketch than this, but we can take this and use it to create original art just as well as we can do tracing art. So where you might need a little bit more uh, information, you know, obviously you'd want to fill that in, but we're gonna do a deer here. And I'll Usually I would be pulling up reference pictures, but 
I've got a reasonable handle on what a deer looks like. Including so, the wings. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, I just realized I'm drawing this on the wrong layer. So we're going to back out of this. So I'm going to leave my sketch where it is and I'm going to put this on a new layer. So we're going to try that again. And this one is just really quick and dirty. So uh, this one will not be going in the art project right away. Um, what I'm attempting to show with this is that you can apply the same idea to any kind of original drawing that you have. It's just a question of learning to manipulate the art in the way that makes you happy. Um, and then let's say that suddenly instead of having a, oh, hang on, let me get this more fleshed out before I start doing this. Gave it a little bunny tail, but that'll work. All right, so we have our deer. Let's say instead of this being a lodge deer, or um, that we want it to be a rampant deer. So cool, I'm gonna turn the sketch layer off. We're done with that. So to make this rampant, what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to make some changes. First off, it needs to be kind of hanging out up at an angle like this. All right, pretty good. Next thing I need to be able to do, no, not that, come here you, is I am going to use the lasso tool. Um, you could also use the selection pin. And I'm going to lasso out just this leg. Everything behind it is clear, so I don't really have to worry about the specifics of what it grabs aside from this. But I do wanna zoom in a little bit and make sure that I'm getting all of the leg and none of the body. So to do that, I've got something called the selection pin. Um, and that just lets me manipulate what exactly is in the selection as opposed to having to redraw or use the add and remove every time. So, all right, now I've gotten that leg selected out. Now I can manipulate just that leg. So we're gonna kind of put it at a better angle like this so it can be more rampant. And now it's kind of the wrong size, so we'll shrink it down. All right, that looks pretty good. We'll need to draw in the other half of this leg. And we can do the same thing on this back leg. Uh, a little bit bigger, there you go. Oops, we're out of room here. Since I am not really set on this being valid thing. We're just going to shrink it down so I can, eh, not that much, like that much. So I have a little bit more room to work here. All right. And then what I want to do is I want that leg to do more like this. And then just this front half, I want it to do this. And I'll draw the knee in. So I don't know if anyone took the, there was somebody who did a class on the heraldic paper doll for postures. Um, that's kind of a similar idea is that we're just, we're changing what we want 
and then we can get it kind of cleaned up and in the right shapes. No, I didn't have a back leg at all, so we're just gonna have to draw that one in. But should start about here. And they do have backward knees with a leg. Cool. So there we go. It's a very quick and dirty deer, but it is a, uh, you can see that we didn't have to change the head. We didn't, we could change the wing if we wanted. Uh, for that, we will go to here, grab the wing. We're just gonna kind of go yoink. and just kind of play with it until it looks right. So if you're having to change something on the fly, um, being able to start from the line art is really helpful. Uh, so there you go. That's how, that's how we go from the quick sketch to something entirely different. So I guess in a similar line, if somebody had just sketched a symbol or a device that they liked just mm -hmm. on a pen and paper and they wanted it digitized, you could scan that in and do the same thing you just did. Just oh, yeah, trace sure over it and create the digital version of it for them to use and manipulate. Let me see if I have one that somebody's done that for. This one, no. No, oh, she sent me a whole one. I'm trying to remember who. Those of us that sit and sketch our devices at work in our free seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I see. Okay, this one went through several revisions. So this is a, a relatively good example. Um, so one of the nice things about doing it digitally is that you don't have to redraw everything. Let me make these extra large so you can see. This one went through a bunch of revisions. Um, I did this one in Inkscape. And one of the things you'll note is that like there was a, we tried all purple, we tried different colors. Um, I was dragging elements around. What if we had, you know, the, paintbrush going this way? What if we had it reversed? What if... So, and then we flip the arrows around going the other way. Um, th this one was, one of the nice things about it is that I could open it up in here. And this is Inkscape, but you can do similar things with layers um, on a raster image. Stop that back. What did you do? Go away. The... Oh, I, okay, that's cool. Sorry, I just stamped that a whole bunch of times by accident. Um, so if, for example, this came back from Kingdom and they said, hey, we really like what you've done, but can you like just make that whole dog a little bit bigger? I can grab this whole dog and just go yoink. Well, obviously now he's off the page, but the idea still holds. Um, in that, you know, oh, client decided they don't want three, they want two. Okay, well now I can go and I can just recenter those and now we've got two. And I didn't have to redraw the whole thing. It's wonderful. It would also allow you to fill the space a little bit bigger for identifiability so you make it a full trend. So yes. pull half of them on it. Look, we can make them much bigger. Um, if we, hang on, I've got some weird clipping going on. We might be able to get the dog a little bit bigger. We might be, um, let me turn clipping off. Yeah, none of that. Knock it off. So um, there's a couple of pretty standard things in image editors is that if you're holding control or shift, it changes how the, the group works or how the resizing works. If you're holding shift, 
this one does it from the center. So no matter what I do to it, it, it tries to do from the center. If you're holding control, it'll do it from the top corner, but it keeps it exactly the same proportions. So that can be really helpful for resizing things. Again, we've wandered into Inkscape, which is, that's its own topic. <laughs> um, so this does similar things. If I hold shift, they're actually reversed here. Shift will keep it the same scale. Control lets me move individual, um, individual corners of the, of the drawing. So I'm going to close out of that without saving. All right, how are we doing on time? We've got about 30 minutes left. That's enough to do one more if we'd like. Um, or any other questions? How are we doing? Just out of curiosity, the programs you're using, do you know if any of them have trial versions or student versions that are available so for people? The, the programs that are free are going to be GIMP, which is similar to Clip Studio that I was working in earlier. And Inkscape is also free. That's the one that lets you do the raster, or the Inkscape lets you do the vectored images. Uh, that's the one I was just in that I was resizing the dog. Okay, cool. Um, both of those are free. Clip Studio is my preference for actually drawing. And that has a three month trial period and then it's $50. Is that 50 a month? No, that's you own it outright. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, because I know I know Photoshop is wonderful about things like that. Just thought I'd ask for clarification. Yes, good, good clarification. Uh, yes, if you choose to use Photoshop or um, Illustrator, any of the Adobe products are going to be a subscription service, unless someone were to theoretically pirate one from much longer ago. Um, also worth mentioning Corel Painter um, and SAI Paint Tool. Um, I have a little bit less experience with those, but they are also, um, they're paid programs that work similarly. Did you prefer the Clip Studio? I prefer Clip Studio. Um, and that's why they give trial versions is so that you can see if it works for your style. Um, some people would absolutely hate this layout. Um, if it doesn't work for you, you can always like change where stuff is. Sure. Uh, you can get rid of entire things. I think there's like, yeah, no. there's a button that I have previously hit. No, not that one. That makes everything like go away and become very minimal but I can't find it now that I'm trying to hit it. Um, it's probably on view somewhere. But... Anyway, uh, a lot of these programs are highly um, customizable. Uh, one of the neat things about Clip Studio is that you can actually record a time lapse of painting and then play it back. Wow, that's pretty nice. Um, so let me, do we have any other questions from the chat is quiet. Okay. All right. Uh, let's pick one more and I will, we'll go ahead and call it the last one. So preferences. How about the flying fish? Lucy. All right. Okay, do you want the one on the hat or the one on the shield? Oh, either one. They look interesting and different. Okay. So we will do, we're going to go through all the usual embiggening process. Switch it up to 300. We're going to drop to 5,000. Make it nice and big. And then we're going to crop it back down to just the part we want. You could also crop it and then 
and then embiggen if that's more your style, but either way works. <clears throat> and give me just a All right, so coming in here, we're gonna need a new layer for the art and a new layer to go underneath. And turn that one off for the moment. And grab our fill bucket with white. Turn our visibility down on the fishy. And grab our pin. Make sure it is in black, not in white, because that would be really awkward to try and paint. Okay, so let's use the, let's use a little bit bigger. This one has some nice bold lines, so we'll go up to an 80. So we'll kind of come in here. And one thing, I don't really have a heavy hand, so anytime I pick a, a number, I rarely get all the way up to the full size of this. Get some little internal detailing here. All right, now I don't like how bold these little line tips are. So I'm going to grab my eraser and just kind of smooth them out a little bit, make them a little bit more pointy. Not too far. There you Oh, I did not do a good job joining my lines today. There we go. All right. She has some internal detailing here. And sometimes you get to where it's a question of interpretation. Um, so I could either draw this as a something like that. Um, I could draw it like this. You have to remember that a lot of these are really tiny drawings to start with. And so sometimes getting a little bit away from what the drawing does and doing something a little bit more artistic is not a bad idea. <laughs> All right, I'm going to come up and do the wings. Uh, one thing that if you find that you're having trouble getting exactly the line width you want, one thing Clip Studio does that's rather nice is it has the pin pressure settings. Um, you can literally just put a scribble on there that, that goes through different, like go from really thin to really thick. Um, and it will automatically try and adjust your settings for you. So that you can get a more accurate line for what you want. And so you can you can actually adjust. So now actually I really want this to do this. So now if I'm slowly pressing harder, it goes really thin for a long while and then it kind of jumps up to a, a more 
sturdy one. So I'm going to cancel out of that because I actually had it where I liked it. Um, but when you're first setting up your tablet, you may need to do a little bit of calibration to kind of figure out what exactly you want out of it. All right. And now I didn't match exactly where all of the feathers were in here. Um, you can if you wanted, but I just want the idea of feathers to match the approximate feathers that were originally drawn. Um, I'm not making really careful exact copies. Um, if that's more your thing, go for it. Uh, but in this case, we're trying to get the spirit of the art more than the actual interpretation of the art. So I try not to overthink it too much. If I'm if I'm sitting here and I'm going exactly like pixel by pixel, go, okay, it goes that much thicker and then this much thinner and then this much thicker. It ends up looking weird. If I sit here and I think about, okay, it kind of does this and then this. It ends up looking a little better, even if it's not exactly the same uh, line that the original was. So I find that that when I'm tracing, if I will follow the spirit of the original artist instead of the exact lines, it works out a lot better for me. All right, so there we go. We got a fishy with wings. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the class uh, so we can go ahead and stop recording here. Um, thank you all for coming. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions. Um, I will, let me put my email in the chat just in case. Um, but you're always welcome to find me at events and talk shop. So. Stop sharing that. There is my email if you need it. And any last questions before we stop recording? Could you also, if you haven't done it already, specify where that heraldry database was that you were showing us? Yes, uh, Book of Traceable Heraldic Art. Um, yes, that one. That is going to be heraldicart.org, not .com. .com is a business. .org is the one that's here. Have some art. Cool. Thank you. Yep. You can also Google search it for Pensic Traceable Art. That pulls up the same site. Okay. Really, Eleanor, thank you very, very much for uh, teaching. Those who attended, thank you very much for attending. I hope you enjoyed this class and the rest of King's College. If it's all right with the instructor, I'm going to stop recording now. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>